All right, tonight we're going to be working on our Unit 9 uh, Python GUI programming, and um, we're going to begin by looking at this first document here uh, entitled How to Make GUI in Python for Data Analysis. Very appropriate for, for our coursework here. And this comes from uh, the website entitled uh, Towards Data Science um, and some articles that we pulled through our membership, Christopher and I. And, you know, so it, this is an, a full on article. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but they, they do talk about kind of um, same kind of path that we're walking. Right. So a lot of people get into this field and, you know, the primary tool that we use, folks, is Excel. And it really is um, for a lot of the work that that we do just to process the data, sort it, analyze it, you know, visualize it, et cetera. Um, and, you know, Excel does a really good job. In fact, it has some very advanced tools, uh, very much like, you know, higher end uh, data analysis tools and can do a lot of the work standalone. And uh, some people who work with data never use any other products, frankly. Um, but um, there is often this, this pathway um, towards crunching super large data sets. And that's where programming tools come in um, to be very helpful because you're working with data sets that if you are, you know, trying to use them in Excel, we did discover that there was some sort of a limit to Excel, and it, and it wasn't in this class, but I think it, we were in uh, maybe Fundamentals of IT, and uh, one of my students uh, did a look up on how many rows of information can you have in Excel, and if somebody wants to look it up and put it in the chat really quick, we might add it to the video, but it, there is a limit, you know, so, and it was something uh, in the range of, let's say, like one million lines of entry in so many columns and if and the columns weren't as extensive as as the rows okay so one million forty eight thousand five hundred and seventy six rows which just happens to be a power of two by the way so it is related to memory constructs curious about the columns what what is it for columns Let's see if you can look that up i'm looking it up but it's being super inconsistent Okay, and that could be the case because it might vary from version to version. It says something around 17,000 though. It says 16,384. You know, you know that sounds depending. right. Yeah. And, I, and I'm thinking it's probably like 16,500 and I'm trying to think of what the power of two is in the 16,000 range. Used to have them all memorized, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's what geeks do. Um, and you know, so they anticipate that you will have more rows than you ever have columns, but that's a lot of columns. 17,000 columns is a lot of columns. So you can get a lot of data into Excel, but believe it or not, there are companies um, that keep just even simple things like server logs of people like logging in and out of a, a system that generate billions of lines of data every day, you know, and how do you deal with data sets that are that big? And where do you process them? And, and, and frankly, what happens is uh, tools like Excel run out of steam, right? So we use uh, Python. Now, we did do some interesting stuff with Python last week where I, um, I forget we were doing uh, which exercise we're doing, the Civ of Aristosthenes. We were trying to figure out the, the prime number sequence. Um, and what was happening is we were putting in these crazy large numbers, some of which exceeded the bounds of the data structures of Python. Um, but even though it took five minutes to run, it still ran. And, and, and frankly, what happens with, with Python is it, you might have a data set so large, it might take hours to run on a huge parallel processing, you know, mainframe computer, um, because the data set is so huge, but it, but it can do the work where in many cases, lower level tools cannot. And that's why, you know, programming is an aspect of this, um, now, what they start to talk about here is uh, the tools that you need to do the work. And for those of you that are familiar with Python on a more granular level and maybe installed it manually from a command prompt, highly unlikely with this group, but possible, um, you might understand that Python really is an interpretive language. It really is to me meant to run at a command line. That's its primary kind of goal. And because of that, it, to install any of the tools or extra libraries that might, you might need, uh, you often do that from the command line. Now, I will tell you that if you did install, um, you know, the Anaconda version of uh, Python with the Spider IDE and the Jupyter Notebook and that little bundle that we have you do in the first Python course, you probably already have all the libraries you need resonant. So you don't, 
need to install the library. So the first thing the author does uh, here is, is he talks about the fact that if you don't have you know, this library, the pandas library, which is one of the primary ones used in data analysis and math and stuff, um, you would go to the prompt and type the pip command and pip install and then whatever library you're installing. So if you're installing pandas, you would type pip install pandas and it would do it. Uh, I will tell you, you don't need to do that though. Um, if, if you install the version that we have, if you find that it's not finding the import, then you may have to do that. And I, I would not anticipate that being the case. Um, now, once we start to work with these libraries, and you guys have learned this in your Python class, sometimes you bring in libraries to do certain functions, uh, you know, mathematical functions most commonly. Uh, and instead of us writing the routines to make it happen on the screen, we just utilize uh, what we call an application programming interface is truly what it is, that has pre written functions within it that we can call by name send certain arguments or parameters to and have it execute its task for our program without us having to create it from scratch. Now, uh, if you're importing any library, of course, that's the syntax right there is just an import statement. In some cases, you will import specific tools from a library, and, and we'll see that as we do our examples. Um, but uh, you can bring in a whole library too. Um, that can weigh down your application though uh, at times. Uh, one thing that we also do uh, with pandas once we have that library uh, installed is we start to read in files and here's where I'm going to start switching over uh, to the Jupyter notebook you guys and start typing some of this stuff in so if you guys uh, aren't catching the hint here this is a really good example to work through so if you have either the Jupyter notebook or your spider IDE or whatever coding tool you're using to do Python uh, please you know get it up on screen and working uh, you will see that I do have a, um, a Jupyter Notebook open here ready to receive code. I uh, haven't even titled it yet, but um, I suppose I should probably give it a name. Let's call it, uh, how about this, uh, Unit 9 Python GUI Examples. All right, so the first thing that we're going to start to throw in here is we're going to put in this uh, import uh, pandas and I'm just going to type that in and move on to the next line. So that's going to be a requirement. Another thing that's going to happen um, and obviously I'm not going to be able to execute this step because I don't have this particular uh, file, but it will demonstrate uh, the approach for doing it. And that is you can set up a variable that can receive an imported file. So we saw this, um, you know, interestingly, from a text file perspective, but it is possible pandas has the capability to read in Excel files directly. Uh, my one little caution here is I don't know if you guys caught that, but I went from a, a printed document that has, you know, angled uh, apostrophes here, which by the way, are much different than standard apostrophes. So when you start to, um, you know, code, these smart quotes is really what they are, really need to be converted to standard quotes like this. So if you ever see those little curly Q ones, you got to change them out, folks, because um, it's not going to work. A programming language does not like the smart double or single quotes. So if they're on an angle or have a little curly Q to them, bad news, uh, get rid of them. Now, of course, I can actually create a file called... Um, data.xls uh, to feed in here. So I may end up uh, doing that. Um, we'll see. <laughs> All right. And then um, the next thing that we start to think about is if we're reading in a file and he's got a very, very, uh, uh, you know, specific example that he's working from here, but I think it's a nice example. He talks about creating a table. Now, when we're working in Excel, the default format for anything we're doing is a, is a table because that's how it's all laid out. I mean, it, you have no choice but to work within a table. Um, but when we're working with a programming language, we have to kind of virtually create the construct. Um, but even though we're doing it virtually, we can still kind of conceptually name things um, to match what they're what we're kind of creating in our head at least. And so that's what he's doing in these next two lines of code. First, he's creating a, 
a, a data group by, and a group by is just a simple function that is kind of collectively naming um, the whole thing. Uh, the other thing that's happening here is he's then defining a table where he's um, setting up, and if you should maybe recognize, you know, kind of the, the format here as what we call uh, a, a dictionary type format in Python. And what that really means is instead of uh, having like a list that has index values for each item, we have uh, basically a, a list or, you know, it's a dictionary technically that uses key value pairs to define um, its contents. Um, and, you know, if you want to learn, and, and, and he's got nice little references here where you can learn about the API and all that. Uh, so you could drop this code uh, in as well. And let's get that over to the document here and paste it in. Right, so that helps to do the grouping and then basically form a, a basic table type structure here. Now, interestingly, after we read that Excel file in, we can convert it. So isn't this interesting that, you know, we, we think that we have to use Excel to read in the CSV file or whatever uh, and create an Excel file. Now, here we are taking an Excel file, converting it to a CSV and outputting it back to that format. Uh, and that's entirely possible with, with uh, these libraries. So you can convert uh, an Excel file to a CSV using this. Now, okay, so the question is why? Um, because most languages like Python will work better with a CSV file than you were with an Excel file. But clearly they have the capability to read them and manipulate them, which I think is fascinating in itself. All right. So here it says, you know, all the above code we can execute in the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and he says, you know, it's his go-to tool for data analysis tasks. And I'm discovering in my own studies on this field, folks, because I'm studying this as I'm teaching it to you, that a lot of people who do really high-end work tend to stay away from the IDEs and do most of the stuff inside of the Jupyter Notebook, understanding that really we're interfacing with the same Python language constructs underneath, right? So the, the IDE that we have is interacting with Python installed with your, on your system uh, and gives you this whole interface to do your work, but it doesn't have to be that interface. Jupyter Notebook is just a different interface. And you can see some of the advantages of it. One of, one of the big advantages really uh, for me is, and from a teaching perspective I'm discovering, is that I can put stuff into the document and see the results and add other things to it and kind of conglomerate it all into one notebook, you know, uh, that holds multiple programs that can execute. And I think it's kind of a neat format. Um, now, what gives us the actual GUI uh, is this piece here called T Kinter, and I, I'm not really sure if there's a different way to say that, but that's the way that I see it. And if you're going to be doing uh, kind of like a whole collection of uh, GUI tasks, and, and, and the libraries that we will be using to do GUI will be from the T Kinter library. Um, and in some cases, you would you know, pick out certain tools. And, and typically it's gonna be the one that you see here, uh, which is the TK library. Um, you'll notice that there's also some other um, things here that they're pulling in. So it says from this uh, tkinter library, they're also pulling in a, a file dialogue uh, library as well. So what does that mean? That you can create interactivity with your file system through the GUI very, very simply uh, and powerfully. Um, and then you can also uh, do this import of the OS. <laughs> no, you're not bringing in the whole operating system, um, but you're bringing in the capability to interface with the operating system is what that's telling you. And it is platform neutral, by the way, so Linux, Mac, or uh, PC would all work with this. Now, I'm not gonna go ahead and type in this code, but I do wanna kind of show you a little bit of uh, what they're doing here structurally so that you understand when you're building your stuff how it works. Um, the, the one thing that you'll notice right off the bat is they do have a predefined function called analysis. And, and let's just read through it just from the standpoint of reading it almost like it's English, 
right? And, and I want you to get into this mindset with this stuff because what's really cool about working with Python in my mind compared to other languages is it's very easy to read the code and figure out what it's doing without even having like formally learned it. I mean, you can kind of at least make an educated guess as to the direction that you're going. So the first thing that they're doing here is they're setting up this, this function called analysis and they're setting up a, a series of variables and each one of the variables is going to be populated. So if you think about what a path statement is, what data is, groups, table, um, a save name, etc. These are all things that apply to files and how we manipulate them, right? So <clears throat> the first one is the path. So what path are you going to open on your file system to get to the file? That's what that means. Um, the next one is the read Excel. So what would we pull in? We would read in whatever file we found at the specific path that we've designated here. So if it's on your C users, you know, Joe's, you know, homework folder or whatever, that path would populate. Uh, then we set up the table in the group like we were talking about above, uh, which helps us to create that construct to kind of put it into. Uh, and then, of course, you would ultimately save it back to a CSV file, in which case you need a save name to give it, like, you know, example.csv, something like that. Um, and then this little routine here uh, puts in the file extension for you automatically. And then we run the table to CSV with the save name and it executes the action and creates this, the CSV file for us. Now, What's fun about this uh, is this next part. Um, this is code that we haven't seen, but this is a pretty common technique in Python, by the way. Um, you know, th what they're doing here, some of you have learned that one way to write a Python program is you can create um, functions and then you can create a main uh, programming uh, function that runs the whole program, right? And, and calls everything and makes it go. And that's kind of what they're doing here, but they're using this interesting uh you know whatever name we choose to also replicate the main uh method and they're saying if the name the main method matches the main method uh then go ahead and run these actions so what happens uh in this series of code first we issue the things from the t Kinter library in order to generate the gui and what we're doing here is we're generating the environment and storing it in a variable called window. So that whole, the whole GUI interface, the window, gets stored in a variable with all of its attributes uh, as an object. Um, we can assign to that window then, or, you know, which is really an aspect of the GUI. Uh, we can give it a title. Uh, so that goes in the title bar of the application. We can uh, determine its basic width and height. So this, in this case, the geometry is 200 by 150, so 200 pixels across, 150 pixels tall. And then we also start to break the, the, the GUI into components itself. And, and if you guys take my Java programming two class ever, if you were web students, we spend like, you know, half a semester kind of doing this, this type of stuff exactly. Um, and what you learn about doing GUI programming is that the window is kind of built in layers of encapsulation. So basically, um, the GUI interface of any application, like even Chrome that I'm running in now, if I come out of full screen with it, you know, whatever aspects I program into that window are basically inside the window, right? I mean, they're, they're inside the environment, uh, including the tabs. And that's an aspect of the program, which is really part of, you know, the frame, which is the inside of the window. Um, the window itself is like kind of like the conveyor. It's kind of like, you know, an automobile carrying passengers, you, you know, whatever you put inside that automobile is up to you, uh, but it is a separate construct. So it's, it's, it's dealt with separately. We program for it separately. Now within that frame, we then start to kind of break down that space inside the window to place objects. And from a really simplistic uh, standpoint, uh, yes, there's, there's kind of like what we call generically rows and columns, which are really dictated by the content that you're injecting. So if I uh, inserted a large graphic, the first column would be really huge and the first row would be really huge. If it was tiny, it would be really small. Uh, it's kind of dynamically adjusts. And so what they're saying here 
for position grid row zero column zero the top leftmost part of the screen you will uh insert content and and then uh and that will just be basically a little spot on the screen and then we also in the second position for the button place that button in next to it basically one column over so it'll be one spot on the screen and a button next to it now the interesting thing here is how do you see the gui you just run this really simple little command here whatever your program is and that will execute the gui program now what a lot of people don't realize about gui programs is is that they continuously run in a loop so every gui program at its heart is really a bunch of code stuck inside of a loop because if you think about a graphical interface and uh you know they they have a little uh you know snapshot like this um you know this is a program that launches and sits on your screen and what is it doing as it's sitting there well it's not doing nothing it actually is running that big loop waiting for you to interact as a user with the interface components on the screen whatever they happen to be the window controls are part of the operating system right um but the stuff inside you know you know the the window that is stuff that we control and that button that they've put here is just sitting there uh waiting for us to click and that happens in a loop you know you know while while you know there's no button being clicked um keep running this until somebody clicks something and then depending on what cl they click on or do or drag or drop or whatever let's perform that action as as it is coded now i think interestingly um i could try to run this little bit of code here inside the jupyter notebook this one this should work let's see if i can copy it cleanly has anybody uh in class tried it yet uh, not that one. Oh, not yet okay so i'm just going to paste in this program as is my thinking is is it should work except what didn't happen the indents didn't come in so here I, i'm going to be indenting everything let's see if we can make it run You know, sometimes I worry that in this Jupyter environment, it would, would not work, but hypothetically it should. All right, and let's create a little space there. That looks pretty good. All right, now let's give it a shot and see if it actually works. And what should the program do if I click the button to run? Does anybody want to take a guess? Um, well, did you make that one? Um, Excel file that well, you know, if if you read this code here, Anthony, you know, with the previous example he was giving, they had a specific file, right? I blew that code away. Now I have this generic thing. Do I need to know? Do I have to have that file pre-created, or can I? Uh, feed no, it? not for that one. Yeah, right. That and that's the answer there, right? This is set up allows you to feed in any Excel file. It would probably be handy to feed in one that has something that's pertinent um and you know i'm trying to think of if i have something really handy here i could pull in just bear with me here a sec well you know what Let, let's run it and see what it does first well, so here it is and it's asking us to generate a table brings up the file dialog just like a regular program does and i'm just going to speculate that somewhere in my downloads folder i probably have something appropriate um that might work for for data analysis here, perhaps. Let's see. You guys see any Excel files in here? It's sort right. of by type in the file explorer. Yeah, I, I I'm kind of leaning against that <laughs> right now. Let's uh let's go to a different class here. Here, I, I have an All right, so far so good. Yeah, I'm still getting that same error. And then this next document, I want you to just kind of like rifle through it really quick um, and try to complete uh, the tasks. Now, 
they start once again with this whole concept of like, do you have Python? Do you need to install Python? They do come at it from the standpoint of working on a Linux or Unix machine, which I, I assume most of you are not doing. So these commands are completely irrelevant for you. Um, and then they go back to, um, you know, this concept of pulling in the tkinter libraries. And this is, the, you know, kind of the same approach here. So I'm, once again, I'm going to follow their steps. Hopefully this one doesn't blow up on me, but we're going to give it a shot anyhow. Um, so we'll begin with that first command to import uh, the tkinter library. Let's drop that in. Next, they're going straight to the window here. So this, in this case, they're pulling up the library. They're not using a pseudonym. So what a lot of people do is they import the tkinter library and they say as tk. And what that means is they don't want to type all this out. They just want to type tk each time. Uh, the, so this functional command here is the same as the command we saw in the previous example where it was window.tk.tkparens, same code. So that generates the window. And, and I think this one will work a little bit better because I think it's a little bit more straight ahead. Then, of course, we have to put in um, the loop to run the whole thing. Pretty simple. And they execute it. Now they ask you to, to run it. Of course, we're going to do it right from the notebook here. But that's all it takes to create a windowed application. Here, let's close this old one. There's the one I just created. It is blank. It has nothing in it. Just to show you that these are really the two pieces that you need just to get the GUI. Now, in terms of putting stuff inside there, that's where you have to work with some of these other uh, placement tools and stuff to get the stuff showing up. But that's kind of, you know, the first um, basic. Then you can add the window title in there. And where would you put that in the code? Well, you want to put it before you run the main loop and after the window is created. Um, and if you run that, uh, now you will see here, as we change the size of the window, that is the name that we typed and we are controlling the title. From there, um, they talk about the geometry thing and we kind of mentioned that pretty quickly, easy to demonstrate. So we can control the size of that window. And, you know, just to prove that we can, I'm not going to make a small one. Let's let's make a kind of a ridiculously huge one, actually, um, because, hey, why not, right? A um, little more interesting to make something large. So let's go ahead and run this code. And you can see the size of the window there. Once again, the title is still the same. But we have the ability very quickly and easily to control those things. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, at, at the very least, this helps to demystify a little bit of GUI programming because it's really not necessarily that hard, especially with a language like this. Now, here's a piece that might come in a little bit handy for one of your assignments, hint, hint. Um, and with this particular thing, we are pulling in a user interface element called a label. And a label is usually just a piece of text on the screen that usually labels something else on the screen. So like you might have a, a text box where you want somebody to type and you might label it username or password, for example. Let's uh, go ahead and run that one now. This is kind of reminding me of the Visual Studio's window applications. Yeah, and yeah, it, it you know what, and uh, Anthony, you're right. I mean, it's the same type of approach here. I'm not seeing the label appear on the screen. Are you guys seeing it? I am not seeing it on the screen. So I'm just going to press forward with the example, but I assure you that um, that code normally works just fine. We might have to, oh, yeah, right. We didn't put it on the window. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is the same thing we do we do in Java. You create the thing, but then you have to make it, you have to put it on the window, uh, and that's what this command does here. So now we will see it, and there you can see some label text. Very, very exciting stuff. 
And yes, you can change font sizes and all that stuff if you really want to dig deep. Um, another thing that we can do here is create a button. So we're working towards this, and I am going to copy all of this code all at once. Uh, but not only are we, are we creating the button, the, the button is really created with this command, right? And then as we saw with the label command, the pack command is the one that puts it on the screen. But how about we set up a function that reacts to the button click and notice that we have a little you know, parameter in here, which is the command equals clicked, which is the name of the function that's controlling it. And so this function, what will it do? It will uh, looks like it will change the label text is uh, what it will do. All right, so let's copy all that. Let's see if the formatting sticks in the copy paste. That should be interesting. And we'll just create a separate little area here. No, it did not. So let's make sure we do uh, indent here. And this is really one line of code here. So I'm going to put it all together. All right, let's try running this. All right, so we click the button. And okay, so it created a separate label. So when I put that in, yeah, that's really exciting stuff. All right, so there it is. All right, another thing that uh, you'll be asked to do is to put in uh, an entry box. And an entry box is basically... Uh, a text box. Let's get that on the screen. And that must have came from the copy paste. All right, so there you have a box that you can now type into. And most, you know, programming languages, including, you know, if you're learning it in the Windows environment, would call that a text box. Uh, here they call it entry, you know, entry box, you know. We can also play here with some text. If you look at what this is going to attempt to do, we're going to create some text with a width of 20, height of 5. Um, and I want you to notice we're going to insert hello, insert world. And it's doing it as two separate things. And it's where is it going to insert it to? Into that text variable, which is a text box, and add those two words. And a silly, you know, classic little programming example, but gets the point across um, but what I'm hoping that you guys are seeing here is that you know you know programming um, a GUI application once you learn kind of like the interface commands it's really just a matter of um, you know your imagination or what functional task you need to complete to get the stuff on the screen um, and I think that's kind of the last uh, example here and so that I think that maybe was a better example I probably should have started with that one um, I'm, I'm going to work on the other one and see if I can get it to work though over break. Now, interestingly, um, all the information presented here is close to enough, by the way, to complete all the homework, just from that one little example. Um, some of the other information, you will have to go to some of the other sources to figure out how to do, uh, including either LinkedIn learning or um, looking up uh, the commands in the libraries that come with. Um, we are about an hour in. I'd like to go into break if you guys don't mind. Uh, and then we'll come back and we'll work on the uh, first exercise from Unit 9. So, so you get a flavor. And then uh, we'll move on to Unit 10. So I'll see you guys in five minutes. Um, and so what I did is, you know, during the break is I looked at, you know, this original article and the fact that um, the guy that put it together um, was working with a very specific piece of information. In, in fact, this is the spreadsheet that he had. And what he was trying to do with the spreadsheet is to create a report that groups everybody, calculates the revenue and the number of users. But this is the data that he's working from. And, you know, it's very organized. It has columns and there's all the fields are filled with information so what i did is i'm like you know what um let me take a look at what i was trying to pull in which is this which does not match that at all by any way shape or form and if you look back at our code uh what are we you know we're we're looking at these these columns here 
right? With very specific names in the data file that aren't there. And then on top of it, we're taking the revenue column and summing it, and we're grouping also by length or you know the number of or count of each. Um, and of course, it's not going to work on a file that isn't the same, you know. And that that's what's going on. And so what I did is like, all right, well that doesn't take long to create that data. So I just went ahead and created a spreadsheet really fast, and I just called it sample data, uh, where I created exactly what he had on that document, um, same columns and and real close to the same information. I may have mistyped a thing or two, but I think it's pretty, pretty darn close. So now that I have this created, why don't we try that same program again and see if it works. And if it works, you know, um, like I said, it'll come across as being like marvelously brilliant. Uh, and if it fails horribly, oh, well, uh, lesson learned, I guess. All right. So here's that uh, code running again. And I'm going to pull in the Excel file. This time I'm going to go to my G drive here where I put it in my data analytics folder so I can find it for later. Um, and I think I call that sample data right there. So let's go ahead and open it. All right. And now I want you to notice it apparently is working because now it's asking me to save as, but that's the whole point of, of the uh, program, by the way, is to convert it. So let's go ahead and save it as uh, sample data. I'll do it all lowercase this time uh, and hit save. And no, I'm not going to choose that name. And it should add the CSV. Now the proof is in the pudding. So let's go into the file system now. And if this uh, worked, like I said, it'll seem pretty brilliant when really it's not. It's just doing what it's supposed to do. So let's go to that folder and see if it's there. And there is our sample data CSV file. Yay, it worked. Okay, so. It kind of seems miraculous, but it was really kind of dependent on the data. And this is what it generated. It generated the report. So, it, you know, this is a CSV file. So, um, you know, which group, their revenue, and then a count of each or how many are in that particular group number. And then if you look at the Excel file, you can actually uh, verify all that information pretty easily. Um, but it is not only pulling in the information, converting it to a CSV file, it's doing something a little bit more sophisticated. It's actually uh, aggregating things and performing math on it with these like, super simple little commands. And I think that's, you know, a pretty powerful thing, right? So, yeah, maybe, maybe you can argue it's easier to do it in Excel. But what if you were dealing with 1,500,000 rows of information? You know, I'm just putting it out there. Excel wouldn't be able to handle it. So you would have to go to a tool like this in order to work with the data. But this, I'm glad we got it to work. Uh, here's a, a wonderful little example then. Uh, if it's of any help, and I'm sure it will, will be, uh, I will take that sample data file and drop it into the chat window and you guys can try it on your own. So you don't have to create the file. I'm just sending it to you. Oh. It's not, it's not wanting to let me do that. Let me, let me try a different approach. How about I just put it in the core shell um, here. I'll just add it to the posting, folks. That seems about as easy. And so now the Excel file is attached to the same thing that the document is. So you can use this file to feed into that example. Now I will make a note though, that I did change it a little bit because it wasn't working with the main method the way he had it originally set up the first time. Um, I just put all this window code into a main method and just ran it. Same difference really, it, it works just fine. Um, any questions on this at all, you guys okay? All right. Um, let's just real briefly now uh, get into this first exercise and try to see if we can uh, push through this. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. And so the first exercise says create a, a GUI Python application that resembles the images below. And I want you to notice that what I'm seeing here is uh, a couple of labels. Uh, a text box and this other kind of box we haven't learned about yet, uh, which I will demonstrate for you, and a button. So we have basically five interface components. We have a little window 
It's not very big. You can make it whatever size you want, I suppose, as long as everything fits. And it has a title of Python GUI, but I suppose that could be just about uh, anything. All right, so let's, uh, I want to make sure I'm looking at the right code here on my cheat sheet screen. Let's go ahead and begin uh, working on this. One thing that we know for sure is that we do need to bring in uh, those GUI libraries. So let's go ahead and just get started uh, by doing that. Uh, so I'm just going to become or come in here and start typing in the library name. So we're going to bring in T Kinter. And in the example that I'm working from, we did choose to call it at, by an alias. Um, and that'll be, that'll help us because we can simplify our syntax is really kind of the point of it. Uh, another thing that they're doing is from that same library from T Kinter, we are uh, importing one particular uh, tool here. And I can't quote for you exactly what that one does. I think that's the, uh, the drop down box uh, tool if I'm not mistaken. And I'm just trying to think through that in my head if that's actually what that's doing. I'm not really necessarily sure. So, you know, if you want to get all um, proper about this as well, you know, and since I'm doing this as an example for the homework, why don't we just go ahead and, and say this is um, GUI exercise um, number one. And I'm going to be labeling the little sections here. So this, this first section really is just the imports. And that's typically going to be found at the top of every program that you do. That's the recommended place to put it. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to create the window. Um, and really, we're creating an instance uh, of a window. And uh, the command, if you remember, you can look up above. Uh, you can call it window. I'm going to call mine a win in this case. So I'm just going to do that. And normally, if I wasn't doing this little piece, this TK would say tkinter. So if you see, it's just a way to shortcut it. Uh, next thing we'll do is we'll go ahead and let's let's uh, add a title. Yeah, title the window. Um, and you know, uh, the interesting thing is that we kind of already did that above. So we're just going to copy that approach. We're, we are going to just attach it to window, uh, which I'm calling win in this case. And just I'm just going to say title. And then in parens, inside double quotes, we will say Python, GUI, or whatever, whatever you want to put in there, whatever's appropriate. All right. The other thing that you might want to consider doing, and this, this wasn't in our examples, but we noticed that when we created the window, we dictated a geometry or a size. And, you know, sometimes that's okay, but there are times when you might choose to disable the resizing of a window. And here's, here's a way that you can do that. This is um, from one of the video courses that we want you to watch. And in order to accomplish that, you're just simply going to type window resizable. And then you just put in 0, 0. And that's a way of saying um, don't resize it, basically. Um, now, you know, in the last time that we did this uh, class and we, we taught this, we, um, we actually were turning this feature on and off just to demonstrate it. So... Uh, I will do the same thing as we go, because I don't consider this really a necessity for most programs, uh, but it's interesting to know how to do it. Next thing that we're going to do is let's go ahead and um, add a label. And if you look at the uh, example, right, we have uh, enter a name and choose a number. Those are the two labels we need to create. And... I'm going to create uh, one 
called a label and I'm going to just kind of paste the code in here folks to kind of get it going. And so I'm just setting up a variable called a label to hold it and I'm and I'm pulling it in from uh, the, the TK libraries and then I can assign it uh, whatever text I want. Um, and what was the text we were supposed to use uh, enter a name and choose a number. And I'm wondering if I'm using the, the, the right example here. I don't think I am, by the way. Um, What's the difference between TK label and TTK? You know, Anthony, I'm trying to figure that out myself, and, and, and I'm believing that it, it's relative to the type of uh, library that we're pulling from. This is like a, a more specific piece of it. It's also entirely plausible that I can probably comment out this line and just use TK and it works. It's just kind of a different syntax, basically. Um, but that's a good question. I, I wish I could just answer it for you. I, I frankly, I don't know at this point to answer okay. it with any confidence <laughs> and, and sure. be convinced and be convinced that I'm right about it. Um, and right now, I'm not even sure that I'm looking at the right example. I'm building the right problem. I think I might be, I might be doing this one. No, no, I think I'm doing the right one. All right, we'll, we'll find out as we go. All right. All right, so next, uh, next step here, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little sidetracked here. Um, let's go back to the notebook real quick. And we have the label in there. Next, we're going to throw, um, excuse me, just for next piece of this that we're going to add is now we're going to put in uh, a function that is going to allow us to react to a button click uh, eventually. And we haven't created the button yet, but sometimes it's not a bad idea to think about what your button's going to do beforehand. Um, and so what we're going to do here is drop in this code. And this defines a function that's basically going to output, um, you know, hello and whatever your name is. So you're going to type in your name, click the button, and it's going to say hello, Joe, or whatever your name is. Um, which is going to be pulling from that area that we're creating. Next, we're going to change the label. And in this case, we're going to put in the text, uh, enter a name. And I want you to notice the, the grid positioning uh, on this and how that matches up with the previous. Say that one more time. Yeah, the the grid positioning here. See, notice the position column zero, row zero, yep. and how that matches with this label. And really, what's happening here is we are actually replacing the label that we created. Not okay. So the, the thinking is, why on earth would you do that? Why would you create the label and not just put the thing in there right away? The point is to show you that in the aftermath of it, we can alter it directly uh, with code. So you can create the object and then overwrite it, in essence, directly. Now, functionally, why would you do that? I guess you don't functionally need to do that. So you guys might not write that code in there. Um, this is one of Christopher's examples, and I'm not sure why he put that in there. Right, let's go on to the next section, which is to add a text box. And in this case, I want you to notice that we are creating a variable, and now you can see the connection here between uh, the function and the regular code, that is going to hold whatever we're typing into the text box, and it will allow us to pull it in as a string. Once we have that uh, put in, uh, we can process it with you know, other code. Uh, the other thing that I think is kind of interesting here is that we can control the size of that uh, text box. So in the line below this one, 
you'll notice that we have a width declared. That's what we call the number of text columns, so 12 letters roughly. Um, and what are we calling the variable associated with it name? So we're kind of attributing it, uh, you know, so they're kind of like locked together uh, conceptually at least. All right. Once you notice the position on this one though, this is going to be row one. So it's going to be below the labels. It's still in column zero, but below the label. Finally, you can add a button to this. And I, and I get the feeling I'm not building the first exercise here, folks, now that I'm looking at it. We didn't <clears throat> label it very well in our solution folder, but that's okay. Still a good example. Still getting you one of the homework things <laughs> done. Uh, then finally, we're going to set up a variable called action, which is going to receive, and this is kind of a, a weird approach because, you know, technically you don't need to do it this way. You could replace in this line all of this code, but then you get this really long, hairy command. Um, and so a lot of people will take, you know, things like this, basically uh, user interface objects, assign them to a variable, all the stuff follows with it, and then you just add whatever methods you need to it. Uh, the click me button, which is uh, going to trigger the click me function, uh, will be in column one, row one, as you will see just in a moment here. So finally, in order to see this, we should probably get it on the screen, which means we get, need to get the whole GUI going. And we run that main loop to run the GUI. All right, let's, let's run this and see how it works. All right, you can see it popped up here. Oh, it's got, still got the old one. Sorry, there we go. Here's the new one. All right, so this isn't that the exercise I thought it was, but it's real close. But you can enter your name here, and I know this is like super, super tiny. Uh, and, you know, I'm just going to type in Joe, and you click, and it says, hello, Joe, right on the button. All right, that, that's the exercise, folks. Now, which one is that? That is the first no, it's, it's actually none of these, exactly. Uh, it's closest to uh, this one here, but it's not quite. All right, so you, you will have to um, look up how to accomplish, accomplish this other part of it, uh, but I've kind of completed the first step for you. Now, where do you find that stuff? That's what these um, videos are about. So they demonstrate all of these techniques uh, in these videos, and if you watch through all of these, you will have whatever you need to complete the work. And if you're clever about it, you can go, you can target it and go right to the video you need to get the information you need to get it on screen. Um, I do find, you know, for what limited experience I have in Python GUI programming, that it is a really fast language in learning it, um, much faster than most of the others that I've used. You know, with, with the exception of tools like Visual Studio or Scene Builder for Java, where you can drag and drop interface components, but in terms of just straight up code entry of creating GUI, this is one of the, the cleanest that I've seen. A any question on this before I end the video? The, I'm going to stop on the chapter nine stuff and we're going to move over to unit 10 stuff now. Yeah, mine's not quite running. I'm having a couple of yeah, errors. Yeah, mine's not either. Can you maybe show us the Python? Sure. I'll, I'll end the video here and then, then we'll do some troubleshooting. Sweet. Excellent. 